Friends, the Lord be with you. Good morning and happy Memorial Day weekend. Welcome to Cumberland United Methodist Church, where discipleship comes alive. I am so pleased that you have joined us today, whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary or on YouTube or on Facebook. Thank you for your commitment to sacred community here at Cumberland UMC. By supporting God's work here, you help the love of God to come alive in our neighborhood and in our community. Now, you may notice that we're missing some key people this morning. On Wednesday, we learned that Pastor Ronnie had tested positive for COVID. He uh, wants you to know that he's had very mild symptoms, but that he is uh, quarantining for the full uh, recommended time of the CDC. And then later in the week, we learned that Robin has COVID. <laughs> and so I don't have an update on Robin, but I can tell you that she was emailing me yesterday and she was very concerned about getting all the things ready for this morning. <laughs> and then yesterday afternoon, I was washing dishes and well, I went to battle with a mandolin slicer and it won. So we're quite the worship team <laughs> that you have before you this week. <laughs> I want to let you know that today we'll be wrapping up our series called uh, Profiles in Faith. Uh, I'll be uh, sharing a bit about Esther. Next week we will uh, begin a new series. Next week is, we'll celebrate Pentecost and we'll start a new series called Anything is Possible. We've got some exciting things uh, coming up with worship, so please stay tuned uh, as we're all on the mend. <laughs> There's a new book study beginning uh, Wednesday that is called Last Call from Serving Drinks to Serving Jesus. It details the story of a former bartender who becomes a pastor and how he's seen God's grace in all of his journey. So if you're interested in that study please email the church office in order to get signed up and it's a uh, the study is over zoom so if you'd like to participate uh, contact the church office for the meeting id and password you are welcome to join by the way even if you haven't gotten your reading done so if you're interested uh, reach out this week as we get started with that friends let's stand as we are able and join together in our call to worship. If it had not been God who was on our side, would have been swallowed us whole. If it had not been God who was on our side, the sorrows of our time would have swept us away. Are any among us suffering? Come and pray. Are any among us cheerful? Come, sing songs of praise. Are any among us sick? Come and ask for healing. Our help is in God. The one who made heaven and earth. Call upon God, creator and rescuer. God is on our side. Friends, let's remain standing as we sing our first hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
Please be seated. Let's join together in our opening prayer. Eternal God, you create us and you rescue us. Be here with us now. Help us know how much we need you. Teach us that no other power can support us like your power. As you share your power with us, teach us to be Christ to the world, proclaiming your reign for all people as you lavish your love upon us. Help us receive that love and offer it to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's enjoy this children's message. Good morning, CUNC. This is Rowling reporting. God has laid out plans for all of us. He's created us for a specific purpose, and He knows the plans that He has for us and the steps that He's ordered before we were even born. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God knows all of us. And back in the Bible days, He knew all of those people too. So today we're going to talk about a special lady who God had some special plans for and created her specifically for those plans. I'm going to check in with some of my friends to help you learn about the story of Esther. Kids, take it away. Kids, have you ever wondered what it would be like if you were born in a different place or time? Like what if you lived in a castle with chivalrous knights? Or what if you lived in the Wild West with cowboys? Or maybe in the age of the dinosaur? Did you know that God has actually put you right where he wants you? And he puts you here for a reason? And that's what we're learning about today in another Old Testament story. And this time, it's about a woman named Esther. Beautiful Esther went from pauper to princess. Esther was born in a really hard time in Israel's history. In fact, they weren't even really a country anymore. Life was pretty hard for Esther too. Her parents died when she was really young. So her uncle Mordecai adopted her. But God had a plan for Esther because one day something really crazy happened. The king had a beauty contest to see who would be the next queen. And Esther won. Ladies and gentlemen, next queen is... Miss Israel! Wow! She was going to be the next queen. But then the story took a weird twist. Haman was a bad guy who tried to get rid of God's people. Haman was one of the king's counselors, and he hated God's people, the Israelites. So he tried to trick the king into hating them too, so that he could get rid of all of them. When Mordecai heard this, he said something really important to Esther. Memory verse! Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Mordecai knew that God wouldn't let some evil guy wipe out his people. He knew that God had a plan and that Esther could be a big part of it. He knew that Esther was in just the right place, just the right time. So Mordecai and Esther outsmarted the bad guys. The king ended up really liking Mordecai and he really, really liked his beautiful queen, Esther. So when Esther asked the king to invite Haman over for dinner, he listened. Haman thought he was going to get a promotion or something, but he was wrong. Esther told him to leave her people alone. And when the king heard what Haman was doing, he got really mad. So instead of getting rid of God's people, the king got rid of Haman. Here's what we can learn from this, kids. God has you right where you are for a reason. That's why you were born with the dinosaurs. God has you right where he wants you, just like Esther. He put you in your school, family, and even neighborhood so you could fulfill his purpose. Can you think of something great he might do through you? Keep honoring God 
and tell your friends about Jesus and you'll be on your way. Thank you kids for sharing the story of Esther. Esther's story is so powerful because we may not know our plans, but God already has them laid out for us. Esther 4 verse 14 says, perhaps you were born for such a time as this. God has created us to make the connections that we've made, whether that be at school, at home, in your neighborhood, at church. God has placed us all in each other's lives for a reason. So we will always trust him and know that he has a plan even bigger than we can ever imagine. I hope you guys have a great week and I'll see you next time. Bye. we move into our time of offering let's hear these words 
Jesus Christ is on our side, offering us the love of God, a love that gives us all we have, a love that makes us all we are. Jesus Christ is with us in every circumstance, suffering with us when we are in trouble and rejoicing with us when we are glad. The generosity of Christ calls us to lives of gratitude and generosity. In Jesus Christ, we are given new life. Let us celebrate this life by giving generously to the work of God's redeeming love. Thank you for your commitment to God's work at Cumberland United Methodist Church. As a leadership team, we want to let you know that by supporting God's work at CUMC, you help discipleship to come alive in our faith community and beyond. If you're joining us in person, the easiest way to give is to drop your offering in the plate as you leave the sanctuary at the end of service. For those joining remotely, there are three easy ways to give. You can mail your offering to Cumberland UMC 219 North Musing, Indianapolis, Indiana 46229 or you can use online giving. To do so, simply go to www.cumberlandumc.com and scroll to the bottom of the page. With both PayPal and Givelify, you'll see prompts that ask you the amount and frequency of your giving. Both are intuitive and user-friendly, but feel free to reach out to members of our leadership team if you have any questions. God bless you and thank you for continuing to support God's work at CUMC. prayer of dedication. Giving God, we can never match your generosity. When we are in need, you are at our side. Present to us even in our darkest moments. You rescue us from harm. Make us into a people who celebrate your goodness, drawing others into the celebration of your many blessings. Receive our offerings even if they are as small as a drink for someone who thirsts, transform them into the mystery of your reign here and now on earth. In the name of Jesus, your greatest gift. Amen. Friends, this time is a time for us to reflect on those things that are on our hearts this morning, on our hearts from this week, that you might want to share in just a few moments in our uh, time of uh, sharing joys and concerns.
think it goes without saying this morning that um, everything we've heard from Uvalde, Texas this week is weighing on all of us, weighing on our hearts and our minds as we think about children and teachers. In a few moments before we start the pastoral prayer, we're going to have just some time of silent prayer to lift up um, the whole community. The whole community uh, there is hurting, and our whole country is hurting. Uh, but for now, for everyone in, in Texas, God in your mercy. What are the joys and the concerns on your hearts this morning? I saw this morning on Channel 13 half that Lucille Raines' residence, there was a fire at 5 o'clock this morning. Those that you may not know, Lucille Raines' residence is a three-quarter house for those with substance abuse that is totally financed by United Methodist Women in Indiana. Um, so one lady did die. They said she had come out twice and then went back in again. Um, I hope Carolyn Marshall wasn't spending their night there last night because I could see her doing that. But please pray for the residents and the staff at Lucille Rains. And uh, you know, it, it, this is just such a big place for those people to be able to gain sobriety and get out into the world. They're there about a year or more as they get their, their lives in order. So please pray for them. Yeah, thank you. For everyone at Lucille Rains this morning, God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Well, I have a joy. Well, there was a concern too, but um, Saturday the 4th, I am leaving for Iceland for my grandson's wedding. So there's joy in the wedding, concern for me on a plane, and um, just pray for us while we're all gone. Ronnie d decided not to go because of his health, but the rest of the family is going, so he may be left alone. <laughs> no, we're thinking positive. <laughs> Well, let's celebrate a wedding and a really, f what sounds like a really fun trip. Let's celebrate that this morning. We need to celebrate something. <laughs> and for safe travels and husbands left home alone. <laughs> God in your mercy, hear our prayer. So I have a joy and a concern too. Um, my son in South Carolina, his wife got their first house, and that was an ordeal just in this market, finding something and, and all that. And then literally like three days before they were supposed to close, uh, he got COVID. The next day, his wife got COVID. So they did the closing from their car. Their symptoms are mild, so it's not a, not a huge deal, but that's, that's the concern. Wow, thank you. Isn't it amazing how flexible we've learned to be? Yes. <laughs> well, for recovery from COVID, for your son and daughter-in-law, for Ronnie and Robin and all the others in our lives that we know this morning, God in your mercy, hear our prayer. I guess we need to end on a joy. My school finished Friday. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a couple to share from online. Um, it, it is a joy and a continued prayer concern. Um, I don't know if you were following, Jerry Grunyard was sharing our, our preemie, um, Chase, the son of uh, Chris and Naomi Townsend. Well, he is now home. Um, he is thriving. So that is, that is the joy. He is still on a feeding tube um, and is still on oxygen, though, even though he is 
gaining weight. He's great. He's over eight pounds, but, uh, and his home, which is the joy, but still continued prayers for his uh, growth and, yes. and, uh, and uh, that, but that's still a joy. Wonderful. Well, let's celebrate. Am I remembering correctly? Chase was born at a pound and oh, he was very, very micro preemie, very and tiny. And he's yes, over he was, eight pounds. How many days, Jesse? Did do you remember? It was a hundred and um, at the leadership meeting Monday? I think it, she said one hundred and seven days. So yes, it was days in the NICU. Yeah, quite a yes. few days in the NICU unit. So we can celebrate that. Yes, we can we celebrate can. that. Yeah. Yeah. And for continued healing for Chase's still very tiny body, God yeah. in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. And Robin shares, she said she didn't get on in time for announcements, so she assumes that it had been announced that, that she is, ha, is home with COVID, but still can, you know, prayers for her. She said she has uh, no smell or taste at the moment. Uh, she is thankful for friends who can step up. Thank you, Joni. And, and Gary, who can step in, step up, and make sure things that run smoothly on Sunday morning. So that in itself is a, is a joy, and um, it can be intimidating. She understands that, but she said she appreciates all the help that she gets here. So continue prayers for her healing, and uh, she appreciates all the help that she gets. Wonderful. Yeah, it really is a thing to celebrate uh, here at Cumberland that we have people that can so quickly step in uh, to run the sound booth, to run our screens, to step in for uh, music yes. when Kathy needed to be out. Yep. Uh, it really is it really is a blessing, something to celebrate here. That's what a family does. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and then also Jerry uh, Grenier would like to lift up a prayer concern. Um, Ron Sparks fell and broke his hip this work week. Mm -hmm. He will have surgery on Friday. Uh, and then Donna is still in assisted living in Greenfield, so your prayers are needed for both of them. Okay. So for Ron and for Donna, for healing, God in your mercy, hear our prayers. Any others this morning before we move on? Okay, let's move on to our, in our time of prayer. I'm going to invite us to spend just a few moments in silent prayer for uh, all of the people in Uvalde, Texas, and for the ways that uh, school violence affects everyone in our country. We'll spend just a few moments here so that you can lift up whatever is on your heart about that this morning. Gracious God, even on this morning when our hearts are heavy, we offer you our thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for all the blessings that you so abundantly give to us. For birds flying overhead, for cups of coffee that welcome a new morning, for the deep delight when we think of those that we love. God, this morning we pray for those whose hearts are so heavy that they, they cannot be attentive to the joyful blessings around them. Give us ears to listen to the suffering of others. Hearts can feel the burdens of others. And feet to act in order to make a better world. Be with us, we pray. God, in your mercy hear our prayer. Merciful Christ, when you walked the earth, they called you a teacher and a healer. We live in a world today that is in need of your instruction and healing. 
from the east side of Indianapolis to Eastern Europe, and especially today from Buffalo, New York to Uvalde, Texas. Our thoughts wander to those of us whose problems weigh heavily on our hearts today. We live in a world where fear and chaos and gun violence often seem to overtake the beauty of life. Give us grace to take the small steps of love and justice and to realize that it makes a difference to you. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Holy Spirit, your presence calms us and empowers us. You move like the wind, and yet you stay present in our very hearts. We surrender to you our fears and anxieties. There are those among us who know the pounding of chronic pain, the uncertainty of unrevealed tomorrows, and the weight of unresolved conflicts. Give us the grace to persist even when things are challenging. Help us to seek you even in our despair. May we be grounded in your holy presence. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now let's join together in the prayer Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For then is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, our scripture lesson this morning comes from Esther, chapter 4, verse 14. For if you keep silence... At this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, if you've been with us since Easter, you might remember that we have been focusing on biblical characters each week, looking at one person in particular, and today we're going to look at Esther. Now, the book of Esther is actually fairly small, and I looked uh, this week in my study Bible, it's only 10 pages uh, of the whole Bible, but it's a story that could just as easily be a romance novel or a fairy tale. You see, there's a beautiful orphaned heroine, a wicked villain, a wise old man, and sort of a happily ever after. The book of Esther begins with King Ahasuerus. We're just going to call him the king. King hosted a party for his officials, his officers, and other leaders, and really the point of the party could, was just to, so everybody could see how great the king was. He was that kind of king. He showed off his kingdom, his possessions, and the passages in Esther go into kind of great detail talking about this very ornate and uh, lavish party. In fact, it says that uh, that wine was even served in cups made of gold, you know, like people do. Well, at the end of the party, the king wants to show off his queen. So the story tells us that he sends for Queen Vashti because she is beautiful. He wants her to be paraded around wearing a crown. Now, some scholars read this passage that he wanted her to be paraded around wearing only the crown, but we're going to keep it PG this morning. <laughs> At any rate, Queen Vashti refuses. She's not interested in being paraded around. Now, you see, nobody is allowed to enter the king's presence without being called for, and that includes his wives. 
And so he decides as punishment for Vashti to never call on her again. We might say that Vashti has found herself in a win-win situation. <laughs> At any rate, the king's officials have to search for a new queen. And this is where Esther enters our story. As you heard in the children's message, Esther is also very beautiful. And the king's officers gather up some of the beautiful women. And they give them beauty treatments for months and months. After the beauty treatments have ended, each one of them is introduced to the king. And alas, he chooses Esther to be his new queen because after seeing her one time, he loved her the most. Esther is Jewish, and she doesn't mention that to the king. You see, her parents died when she was young, and she had been raised by her older cousin, Mordecai. Now, Mordecai works at the king's gate, and in fact, there's a point in the story in which Mordecai uh, hears about a plan to kill the king, and he gets word to Esther, um, and Esther gets, words, gets that word to the king, and well, let's just say uh, those folks are taken care of. But then a man named Haman is promoted above all the other officials by the king. And Haman decides that the people who work at the king's gate should bow or kneel to him. Well, Mordecai refuses to do that because of his Jewish faith. And Haman is angry. He's so angry that he decides not only should Mordecai die, but all the Jewish people should die, including women and children. And he gets the king to approve this decree because he tells him, he says, King, there are some people living in this land who have their own laws. And they refuse to obey the king's laws, and the king shouldn't have to put up with that. In other words, he manipulated the king's giant ego. Well, Esther hears about the decree to kill all of the Jewish people, and she has to do something. I mean, these are her people. And remember, though, that even just approaching the king without being called for could get a person killed. And so Esther devises a plan to place herself in the courtyard where the king will see her and then he approaches her and she says, I would just love to host a banquet for you and Haman. And then she hosts another banquet. And at the second banquet, when the king says, what is your wish, Queen Esther? For the first time revealing her Jewishness, she says, give me my life and the lives of my people. And she goes on to tell the king about Haman's decree, and the king, well, also has Haman taken care of. And the Jewish people, including Esther, live. Now that is the Cliff Notes version of Esther. I have to tell you that my modern ears struggle a bit with the story. We hear some troubling things. Some scholars actually argue that Queen Vashti is the hero because she stood up for her own dignity. And I can agree with that, particularly as a woman, particularly as a mother of daughters. Esther is obviously smart and clever, and frankly, I would much rather hear this story read focused on that rather than how pretty she is. And... If we put ourselves in the context of this story, at a time when women had no rights and no power unless a man gave her some, Esther could have felt completely powerless to save her people. But instead, she used the power she had. She used the place of privilege that she had for such a time as this 
and she saved her people. Now I want you to know that Ronnie and I planned this series months ago. But as I prepared this week, I couldn't help but think about how powerless we've all felt this week. There's a little secret that preachers have, especially if we've served other churches. You know we have some sermons. And especially when we're called on to preach on short notice, sometimes we'll look at those other sermons for inspiration. And so Wednesday night I was on the phone with a friend of mine and I said, well, Ronnie has COVID and we're in the middle of this series and I'm going to need to preach about Esther. And my friend said, oh, well, maybe you already have a sermon that'll work about Esther. And I said, you know, I don't have an Esther sermon, but I do have a school shooting sermon. Felt a little queasy as those words left my mouth. Then I remembered Esther and how very much she has to say to us this morning. Because rather than accept her lack of authority, she found the place where she had some power. There's an interesting thing about the book of Esther. The name of God is never mentioned one time in the whole book. But there is this overarching idea that Esther is placed exactly where she's supposed to be at exactly the right time. Esther had no legal authority. She wasn't powerless, though, to the circumstances before her. And neither are we. For as much as we need better policies for a whole host of issues, and it is absolutely important to get out and vote for the people who seem to have the better ideas about those policies, we don't have to sit around and wait for the government to fix our problems. When was the last time the government fixed your problems? I don't have the solution. You don't have the solution. But I think we can all agree that we have a problem. And probably a problem that doesn't just have one answer. But I do think we're capable of figuring this out. But before we can figure out what will work, we have to stop arguing about what won't. Friends, I'm sure you saw it too this week. While dozens of terrorized parents were huddled up waiting to hear if their child was alive, their child was injured, or if they were one of the lucky ones that were going to take their very traumatized child home with them that night, the rest of this country was already arguing about guns and politics. Because some say, well, it's not about guns, it's about parenting. Well, it's not about parenting, it's about mental health. Well, it's not about mental health, it's about video games. Well, it's not about that. It's not about the laws. It's not about the schools. What if we could just all agree to figure out what it is about instead of what it's not about? What if we could put down our divisive politics and our clever social media posts and just figure out what we need to do. What if keeping kids safe and healthy and well-adjusted was no longer a conservative idea or a liberal idea? What if it was just a human idea? What if it was a Christian idea? What if the biggest issue we had to tackle is to find out what is wrong with our children, what is wrong with our sons. Nearly every school shooter is a white boy or young man. They're still babies themselves. And I think if the Jesus followers in the United States 
agreed to participate to really figure this thing out. I think we can. Because you see, friends, we have a soul problem. And we are in the soul business. We see a soul problem every time this happens in our country. There's a soul problem when we hang on to being right instead of thinking about what might work. And just like Esther, we don't need any legal authority to save the lives of our people, to save the lives of our children. Rather, we need to think about the places we do have power, maybe even the places that we have privilege. And we need to pray about what it is we're called to do for such a time as this. When Columbine happened, my oldest daughter was in preschool. And when Sandy Hook happened, my youngest daughter was in kindergarten. My children have known school shootings their whole lives. But someday I'm going to have grandchildren, and they don't need to. They don't need to know this. We can fix this. And I know we can fix it because our children are being raised in an inflammatory society. In their lifetime, they've only known political smear campaigns. Everywhere they turn, they hear complicated issues being argued in sound bites. They hear us versus them. They hear grown-ups more interested in being right than figuring things out. How in the world are they supposed to learn an accurate understanding of humanity? And we're all responsible for that. Now, I'm sure you hear it, too. Every time something like this happens, somebody stands up and says, well, the problem is we've taken Christ out of our schools. Christ has not left our schools. And he surely hasn't left our children. But if our kids aren't seeing Christ, it's because we haven't shown them Christ. And that is not the job of teachers. That is the job of the church. That's you and me. Because our kids experience violence every day. It is an act of violence when any child in a wealthy nation doesn't get adequate nutrition. It is an act of violence when any child doesn't have good enough health care. It's an act of violence when any child anywhere learns that they matter less than other children simply because of what side of town they live on or what color their skin is or their family's heritage or where they worship. We are not powerless. We're not stuck. Last fall, I officiated a wedding, beautiful wedding, on the family's property. The ceremony was held out in a field. And the bride and groom uh, wanted for their unity ceremony to have this thing where I tied ribbons around their hands and their fingers, and then they, when they pulled on them, it tied the knot. It's a clever idea. Apparently, the idea is you make it into some artwork, you have it on your wall. But here's the thing. I am not good at arts and crafts. <laughs> Anybody sitting over here uh, and down front can tell you that. <laughs> and I was so nervous about getting this wrong because if they pulled that knot, it was, gonna, it was not going to be good if it didn't work. But I had to move around quite a bit, right, because I had to get around her pinky and around his thumb, and anyway. We were just a few minutes into the ceremony when I realized that my very short heel had sunken into the earth. I don't know how I missed that when I was figuring out what I was going to wear. But I stood there thinking, I'm stuck 
and I have to do this thing, and there's no way that I can do it without taking a step this way and a step that way. And if I really pull hard, my shoe's probably going to go flying. And so the time came to do the arts and crafts part of the ceremony. And it occurred to me that I wasn't stuck. My shoes were stuck. And so I stepped out of my shoes, and I did the rest of the ceremony barefoot in the grass. Thankfully, you know, brides and grooms get real nervous. They didn't even notice. <laughs> but I thought about that a lot, about how often we feel like we're stuck, because some circumstances are stuck, but we're not stuck. We're not stuck. Friends, we are not powerless. We have all the power to be Christ to a child today, to be Christ to a teacher today. We're not stuck. There are things that we can do for such a time as this. Amen.
Let's join together. Creating and rescuing God. Your power amazes us, yet even in our amazement, we take too long to turn to you, forgetting that you are the power that makes and saves and sustains us. Even when we claim your power, we often do so for our own success and comfort ignoring your command to use your power on behalf of the weak, the small, and the vulnerable. In Jesus Christ, you show us that you are on the side of all people, but never at the expense of the weakest among us. Forgive us when we try to hoard you for ourselves and try to control who has access to your love. Forgive us when our greed, our control, and our scandals keep others from knowing you. Redeem us and transform us, O oh God. Open our hearts, our lives, and our ministries that we may become a doorway to your realm. God turns our sorrows into gladness and our times of mourning into celebration. God hears the prayers of faith. Be confident as we pray for one another, for God heals us. Christ has saved you, and Christ has saved me. You are loved. You are forgiven. You will be made whole. Amen. As forgiven and reconciled people, let us join together at Christ's table. That it was on the night in which Christ was that he took the bread and after giving thanks he broke it and said take and eat this is my body which is given for you as often as you eat this bread do so in remember remembrance of me friends let us partake in the body of Christ And likewise, when supper was over, Christ took the cup, and after giving thanks, he poured it out, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant. The new covenant poured out for you and for the remission of sins. As often as you drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, let us partake in the poured out blood of Christ.
Let's pray. Holy God, as we gather around your table once more to receive the bread of life and the cup of salvation, empower us, empower us, use us in the places where we can do your work for such a time as this. In Christ's holy name, amen. Let us stand for our closing hymn. Here I am, Lord, number 593. <laughs>
Beloved of God, go forth to love God's world. Friends of Christ, go forth to befriend others. Blessed of the Spirit, go forth to be a blessing. In the name of our triune God, Father, Spirit, Son, may it be so. Amen.